So the, the biggest uh, question to, for me in the universe is, why in the world can't people take their clocks down or cover them up when they paint? But I've not hardly got my hands on a wall clock yet that didn't have paint on it. But anyway. Hello, my name is Sam Thornton. I'm a member of the NAWCC Chapter 35 in Louisville, Kentucky. This video is a presentation that was recently done uh, along with a display that Chapter 35 presented in June at the Reschedule Regional in Lexington, uh, which we co-host with uh, Chapter 140. Uh, this display and presentation subject was self-winding clocks those manufactured from late 1800s roughly through the 1950s. I want to thank Derek Phelps, Joe Wilkins, and Bob Burton for allowing us to join clocks from their collections with some from mine in order to make this display of functioning self-widening clocks possible. Also, special thanks to Dale French for videoing the presentation and to Eric Michelson for editing and posting the video for us. I hope you enjoy it. Well, I'm going to go through these and tell you what I know about them. That won't take too long. Uh, I'm not trying to fill in all the gaps of who made them and when they were patented and all that sort of thing. You can look that up on the internet. But I just want to talk about each of them, the types, how they uh, are the same, how they're different, and uh, just a little bit of basic operation on all of them. This big boy here is a, a Buell. This is probably about 1910, and it has a coil inside of the pendulum and it has two wires that run up to the mechanism up here and there's a switch that makes and breaks and this magnet uh, what I read online they're calling that magnetic rod a tri pole magnet you know most magnets have a north and a south this one they say has a tri pole so I'm not exactly sure how that works it kind of hinted that it starts in the middle and it goes out like it's two separate magnets. But when this coil has power on it, it pushes away from that magnetic field from the rod, and then when it swings out, that switch is broken and it swings back. And that switch mechanism also has a gear uh, arrangement where it pushes a ratcheting gear and it turns the motion works. Now these three, this one I just picked up about 10 minutes ago, I'm going to repair for somebody. These three are uh, Kundos, which are German, and they are basically copies of the original Buell design. The only difference being on these, the coil is stationary and the pendulum uh, magnet has, you know, holds the magnet and moves. And uh, to adjust the rate of speed on it, you can see on the bottom of the big one there's a knob that will raise and lower that uh, pendulum bob, which is the coil. You can't lower it so far that it rubs, but you've got a pretty good bit of room there. And on these, there is a counterweight uh, on the uh, pendulum as it swings, and just like any pendulum, if you raise and lower that center of gravity, you, you change the arc and either speed up or slow the clock. So these are Buells, or Buell-like. Anyway, this is the only one that's a, a real Buell. Okay, let's move over to the next one. This one was made by the Self-Winding Clock Company for um, Western Union. And this one's kind of unique. It is a uh, balance wheel movement. You can see up at the top of the movement, there's a balance wheel and not a pendulum. And that allowed this to be very compact shelf clock. Uh, you can see the face has Western Electric on it. Uh, this is made by the Self-Winding Clock Company for Western Union, and Western Union owned them. And that's the only case that I have found where anybody other than the uh, Self-Winding Clock Company owned the clocks. They made these for Western Union, they sold them to Western Union, but everybody else you leased or rented that clock, and they came in and did maintenance, changed movements, changed batteries, uh, and they did all that under the, the lease agreement. Uh, the railroads particularly like these 
uh, self winders, the big self winders, because they have a feature I'll show you in a minute. It's called synchronization. And every hour on the hour, there was a signal sent, and it would zero in the uh, minute hand. And if it had a second hand, it would do it too. So every hour, that clock is corrected. Now, if it was off more than two minutes, that uh, regulating system would not work, and that meant you had to get the clock service to repair. And I'll, I'll show you some of those in a minute. But this is a small Western Union balance wheel. It's kind of unique. Of course, it, it runs on batteries. Um, I don't know for sure what style of battery it originally had. This is probably from the 40s or 50s. Uh, maybe a little older than that, but it had some sort of skinny battery in there. I've got two D cells in it. But that's a, that's a real neat little clock. In front of it, there's three here that are what I call kickers. And you can see on this one, there is a weight right here, and that drives the clock. That's what gives it its power to uh, power the pendulum, turn, turn the wheels. And when that gets to the bottom, there's a set of contacts that will engage the solenoid, and it'll kick it back up. That's why I call them kickers. So I have no idea who made this. Uh, there's no markings on it, nothing that could be identified. Uh, and there were a lot of people in the the electric clock business back in the early 1900s. Uh, battery technology had come to the point where they were reliable, and uh, one of the reasons that all these self-winding clocks use batteries, uh, somebody asked me uh, earlier today, well, why did they just make them where they would run off 120 volt? Um, to give you an example, my house was built in 1896, and in my dining room there was a fixture that was gas, and it was electric. Now, electric was new, and your electricity might come on today, and it might not. Now, there were days that it didn't work in the early days, so people still wanted gas. Uh, so same way with the batteries. The battery was going to work as long as the battery didn't go dead. And through the lease agreement, they came in and changed the battery. So they knew they could depend on that power. And if Mr. Edison's power plant went down for the day, uh, it wasn't going to create a problem. Keeping in mind, the primary users of these clocks were Western Union, who had to have things accurate, and the railroads, which had to keep things accurate so the trains didn't run into each other. So this was kind of a big deal. So even though technology was there for AC, plug it in, uh, they really found that the batteries were better. Uh, we just heard this one pulse. I'm going to turn it around so you can see it. This is another balance wheel and it uh, I mean and it has kicker weights on it and when this gets down to where these contacts are tripped it will re rewind this clock um, same way on this one this has two weights this one's kind of interesting when this one kicks it'll kick both of them up but not both of them up together and when I start this clock, I have to make sure that they're spaced like this or it won't work. And when the solenoid kicks, it'll flip both weights up, but one up to the top and one in the middle. And then they'll, they'll alternate driving the clock. Only has three gears in it, very, very simple. But it does have a second hand that makes it a little unique. And uh, it's hooked directly uh, to the escape wheel. But uh, these, again, run on three volts. Everything here that's uh, powered is, is three volts. That was the common because they could use two, two dry cells. But we don't know who made this one either. This is an unknown manufacturer. This one was kind of kind of neat. We found a, a label inside that said Trinity Electric Clock Company, inter, um, International Newspaper Premium Company. So premiums usually means they gave away something, like the bank used to give away dishes and the gas station and so forth. So somebody in the newspaper industry, they were giving these clocks away. I don't know if it was their carriers or customers or executives or what. But this is a, a nice little oak oil clock, and this face is actually a copper plate. And you have your adjustment on the front where you can uh, set it for fast or slow. So a neat, neat little clock. I think we've covered everything on this table. Pull over here. Over here behind this one. This one's this one is the only one here that's not working. 
I haven't done anything with it yet. I just acquired it days ago. Uh, and the motors burn up on it. This does uh, run off uh, house power, but it has to be a house in Europe because it's 250 volts. Uh, I tried to run it with a transformer only to find out that the motor was burnt up. I'm going to try to find somebody to rewind it because this is a very historically significant clock. And if you look on the label, down in the bottom, it says Aaron Systems Continuous Current. Keep in mind, late 1800s, early 1900s, continuous current was a new uh, invention. And Mr. Aaron, uh, Herman Aaron, was born in Budapest in the early 1800s. He was a physicist, uh, held several patents. He was well known for uh, early electrical meters and measuring current. And um, most of his inventions used some form of a clock to do that job. Uh, his company was later sold and became uh, Simons which is a huge international company today. They do uh, all kinds of electronic controls and that sort of thing. But uh, the reason this clock is significant, he had another invention he patented and he sold the patent to GE of Great Britain. And every time you pay your electric bill, you can thank Herman Aaron because he invented the electric meter. So this, this is kind of pitiful looking right now. It, it'll clean up good and I'm hopeful I can find somebody to rewind the motor in it. Um, displayed on the table is a wonderful article I came across by a gentleman named Bluer. Um, it's hard to find information on these self-winding clocks. Uh, most of what I know about them uh, either came from these pages or trial and error working on them. And uh, this, this kind of gets in depth on uh, the work they did for Western Union and the railroads and the different uh, type uh, movements they had and they, they went through several different uh, models before they came to what is called the F style. And the F style is what is in all of these clocks here that are self-winding company clocks. And it was the last revision. Uh, this company was in business until 1970. Uh, but as they made new movements, new styles, since these clocks were uh, leased, uh, they were required to keep them up to date. So they would take one of these older style movements out and then they'd put the new movement in and that occurred until they all wound up with self-winding movements. There are some clocks out there in the antique world that have some of these uh, old, uh, what they call the uh, not spiral, I can't think of the term, uh, movement anyway, but there were three uh, coils there and this actually rotated and wound up the spring. Uh, the F style movement uses a ratchet system and a vibrating motor rather than a spinning motor to do that and uh, much more efficient. They found they got better uh, use out of their batteries from doing that. Let me come around here, show you a couple of things on this one. This one's a little unique. Um, the thing that made these clocks so popular is they could be outfitted with what was called a synchronizer. And as I mentioned earlier, when you're about either two minutes before or two minutes after, they send out a signal right on the hour, which I'm going to simulate. I've got a battery that will <laughs> send power to this, and it also powered this little bell. But if you watch the minute hand, it pops right to 12 and you hear the bell. That tells you, okay, my clock is, is synchronized now. I can trust that to be the legal, absolute, uh, correct time. Uh, the signals, in some cases, were sent out by uh, the Naval Observatory. They were the ones that uh, were responsible, I guess you would say, for the nation's timekeeping. And uh, early days, there was a, a telegraph signal that was used. Um, in some cases, there was a master clock that somebody manually triggered like I did and reset all the clocks in the school or an office building or railroad uh, buildings. But uh, they had different variations of this. Uh, there's another one here. Let me get over here the other way. This is one that they developed for Western Union. You can see the, 
that says Naval Observatory Time, Western Union. It also still says Self Winding Clock Company, New York. But they did sell these uh, to Western Union. And it has a little bit different feature when it comes around. It synchronizes, but it lights a light. And you get that little red light shows up right there, and you can say, oh, my, my clock just synchronized. Why it was important for people to know that, I'm not sure, but that's kind of bells and whistles, I guess. This one, I added a feature to this. This, this was just for kind of fun. This is a switch that came out of a railroad cabana of the l and Railroad in, Na in uh, Louisville. And the old days, they had the old crank telephones that they used in these. You've seen these little, now they're aluminum little buildings that sit along the railroad tracks. Back then, they were wood, and they called them cabanas. And they would have the telephone in them for the switchmen to use to call the yard or whatever they needed to communicate. Uh, but they still ran off of batteries. So this was the battery switch. And I've put it on this unit just for fun to serve as my synchronizer switch. But anytime you power that coil, you see you've got this linkage system here that will zero that hand. Now all these hands have a bushing mount. You can take a square bushing tool and go in there and tweak that so when you're, you're fully engaged, your synchronizer that your minute hand is exactly at the 12th position. So that was something a technician would do. But you can see the wiring inside of it. Normally there would be two tall uh, dry cell batteries, one and a half volts. There would be one sitting here, one sitting here, and they work in series, so there would be three volts that it would take to drive this clock. Okay, the evolution of the movements that I mentioned earlier, these are the different styles that they have, coming down to the F style. Now the F style frames, pick one up here, F-style frame and everything in between the frames is the same on every F-style. The difference is the junk, I guess you could say, that they add to them. All these external parts that perform different functions are added to the F-movement, but an F-movement's the same. Any part is interchangeable, uh, like I say, between the frames. Um, I've got one here. Let me sit this down. I've taken the escape wheel out of it so it will be run down and you can see the little contacts right here and if I push those contacts down you can see the little vibrator motor I'm going to stop it so you can watch it start vibrating and that operates an arm and it winds that wheel and I'm going to hold this down until I come around every hour there it is the high point of the cam comes around, and when the clock is ticking, not freewheeling like it is now, it takes about 20 seconds for that cam to come up and pass. So every hour for about 20 seconds, you hear that. We have a couple in our home, and uh, my kids and others that are there regularly, uh, every time we hear that, they go, okay, we know the clock's right, you know, it's, it's wound up and it's running. Uh, but these, these are, like I said, the basic F style movement is the same in all of them. And these are kind of neat the way they mount. They've got three captured studs that stay in the movement. You can't get them out. And when you put that movement in there, there's a pin on the mounting bracket that goes in that hole. That lines it up. Then you screw those three movement in there. It was said that even disconnecting the wires that a movement could be changed out in a minute. And that was the advantage of this system that they had of someone coming and servicing your clock. If, if it needed to go back to the shop uh, and be rebuilt in some way, they took that out and put the other one in. Now, Dale, we'll see if we can get a, get a little peek at this. There's a plate inside every self-winding clock company clock that has a serial number on it. That same serial number should match the movement. This one is a match set. Most of them you find in the antique world, they're not original. But when they change the movement, they were supposed to change the plate. And they changed that so many times, those screw holes 
and that wood would get worn out, and sometimes you find them, the plates are just gone, they've fallen out. But uh, this one belongs to Derek Phelps, uh, uh, the chapter here in Lexington, and he's very fortunate in that it is, it is a matching set, because that, that's kind of hard to find. Okay, let's go back here, to the corner of the room. Okay, this is another self-winding uh, clock company clock. The face says Van Slyke self-winding time switch clock. And at the bottom it says manufactured by Seth Thomas Clock Company. Someone mentioned today that these cases look a whole lot like Seth Thomas cases. There's good reason for that, they are. Seth Thomas made the basic movements. All those uh, movements I showed you, the old style, the F movements, that, that actually is made by Seth Thomas, as this big boy was. Now, the thing that makes this unique, the Van Slyke, it was designed, like it says, as a time switch. This turned the lights on in your building. And this is electrically wound, uh, electrically wound spring. It actually has a main spring over there. And this is a, a rotating motor, not a vibrator. Uh, I'm going to plug it up, and uh, hopefully the motor will come on if it's run down enough so you can hear what this thing sounds like. Wouldn't you love to have that next to your desk? It turns on lights. Cam system here that while that will flip a switch that's up in the top. Oh. That thing makes a racket. But at any rate, whatever time you had it set for, uh, it would actually turn the lights on. This, this morning, uh, I was running it and it actually did turn the light on and then we turned it back off. But at any rate, it's like kids, they never behave and do what you want them to do when you want them to do it. But uh, all of this system on front of the basic Seth Thomas movement was an invention of uh, Van Slyke, and he had a patent for it, and these things were in operation a long time. Keep in mind, late 1800s, not early 1900s, this might have gone in a store that had five, you know, bare bulb light bulbs hanging down. This didn't do whole buildings like we think of today. So, but uh, it was very popular, and there were, were a lot of them around. But uh, very nice Tiger Oak Seth Thomas case. And even the uh, the uh, dial pan is mounted in in oak. This one's kind of unique. This is another unknown manufacturer. This is a spring wound clock. I'm gonna pull the pendulum back so you can see the little weight. And that little tiny weight runs this clock. And there's a big wheel here, and the big wheel has a pin in it. And when that gets up to a contact up there, it triggers this solenoid and it will rewind that big wheel. And uh, between the big wheel and the movement is a small wheel and a string goes over it, it's grooved, and that string goes to the weight. So when this, I'm going to simulate it, if you watch, you see that pin there, I'm going to turn this so that pin goes up and touches and see it kicks it back down. And that's what winds that clock, but it's a little little tiny weight is, is what runs it. Uh, nice case. It's got a silver uh, face and a brass bezel. Uh, don't have any markings on it whatsoever. I was hoping somebody here at the show today might be able to identify it, but nobody else had ever seen it. I'll move over here. This is a, another uh, ghoul like the one under glass. It's basically the same movement. Uh, and again, there's the coil. They made it look like there's wire wrapped around the outside of this thing, but that's to kind of uh, fake you out. That's actually string, and the coil is inside of there. You take these caps off the ends, and there is a wood spool, much like a sewing thread spool, but the hole in the middle is much bigger because it has to accommodate this magnet bar. And the wires come off of it, and one of them connects this front rod, and the other one connects to the back, and on top of here is a switch, and it makes and breaks, the contacts make and break. You stop it, and you see it, it actually will start itself up. 
because the magnetic field generated in that coil is pushing against the magnetic field on this rod. And the end of that make and break uh, switch piece is a piece that comes down and hits a gear and turns it, and that's what drives the motion work. So every time this goes back and forth, it gets one notch on that wheel, and that drives the motion works. Very simple movement, not a whole lot to go wrong with it. Uh, the biggest problem is these two very tiny contacts right there. If it's in a dirty environment, they're what sends the electricity down to the coil. They will have to be cleaned periodically. This has a silver and brass face, in interesting face on it. And a nice case. It's got a con convex uh, glass on the front of it, and it's got a beveled uh, glass in the oval in the bottom. Very nice clock. But uh, they were in business making clocks from 1914 to 1952. Uh, the Buell Buell company was. So this one's from around, we think around 1920. Again, it had some sort of dry cell batteries in here. You can see where the acid has leaked and darkened the wood and I've converted it to uh, three um, AA batteries. Okay, this one is another uh, what we call unknown. Uh, it's a neat clock. It's a rotary solenoid that will fire and wind this clock up. It's actually a spring wound movement. It has a, a nice silver face on it. Uh, it's kind of interesting how it mounts. This is uh, slides in like a seat board on a grandfather clock. And if you can see the terminals here, there's two pieces of metal, and then there's two pieces of metal on the seat board, and those mate. Those two pieces of metal have 120 volts on it. So you got to be careful. You don't want to put that in with it plugged in, because if you put your thumbs over that, the clock's not the only thing that's going to get wound up. So this will about, I don't know, every 15 minutes or so, you'll hear this thing and it ratchets. So it doesn't just hit once, it's like clack, 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 clack. So it's another really noisy clock. But a nice case. It has a specification plate and a tight number and a voltage and a sine wave for AC current but it has no manufacturer's name on it. So that's kind of kind of uh, disappointing. I always like to know where they came from. So I was hoping maybe some of the people at the show today might be able to identify some of these unknowns, but nobody else had seen them either. So. Okay, this one has a set uh, that I bought through um, Time Savers, I believe. Uh, and they're the same thing. They've got an insert that comes out. These originally had one D cell in each of them, and the clock ran about six months and quit. So what I did, I bought another uh, battery holder like these that held one battery, and I added one to each cell. So each one of these is still putting out a volt and a half, but they're in series, and they you know, provide the clock with three volts. That one does not have a synchronizer. It, does, it has the holes. It could be added, but it probably never had one. And this one's got the synchronizer package on it. They all have a switch on the side so you can pre-wind it because if it's wound all the way down, it doesn't have any power. Uh, in order to get it going, you've got to wind that spring up enough for the clock to start running. And then once it starts running, the gears will move and the cam will come around and it'll trigger the rewinding itself. But they all had that feature, that one, that one does too. Um, these are nice cases. I'm lucky here. I still have the original paperwork in the bottom that tells you how to hook it up. Um, I'm going to redo a lot of my wires. You can see I've got the original wires in here, and they're, some of them are very frayed. But I found a manufacturer for this uh, cloth covered wire, so I'm going to redo a lot, of, a lot of these wires. But these are, are both identical other than um, this one has a second hand. Oh, that one does too. This one has a second hand with the um, synchronizer on it. This is on a, a little gear and pole there because when this thing synchronizes, it moves the second hand also. 
mine's not in the right position, I need to adjust it, but you couldn't move the escape wheel, so you had to have some sort of slip mechanism to allow this to adjust. That one has a second hand, it's just fixed onto the shaft. Um, the faces on all these are pretty much the same. Uh, they had about three different sizes. The only difference between them was size and whether or not it had a second hand. This mounting pattern is the same on every F-style because it's the post that holds the movement together. So you don't have to worry about different patterns. There was only one. So this one has the plate up here that I mentioned with a serial number on it and it does not unfortunately match this serial number. I get excited if I find a set that matches because it's rare. Um, so, and like I said, I didn't think this was original because of the way the bell's hooked up. The bell bracket is original. I can tell that it was missing the bell. And this is, uh, I think, from our friends at Time Savers and the brass bell that I polished up and put on there. So, um, I like to clean them up good. Um, I use what uh, we in Chapter 35 call 3M or Magic Mystery Mix. And uh, if you mix up a quart each of apple cider vinegar, linseed oil, and turpentine and shake it up real good, it, and use steel wool, 4 off steel wool, it cleans these cases without making them look like they've been stripped. You know, you, I like an antique that looks like it's been lovingly taken care of, not stripped. So this still has the original finish. I didn't take the finish off of it. What I did do was spend 12 hours uh, getting the paint off of it with the visor and an X-Acto knife, picking the paint off. So the, the biggest uh, question for me in the universe is, why in the world can't people take their clocks down or cover them up when they paint? But I've not hardly got my hands on a wall clock yet that didn't have paint on it. But at any rate, that's what I used to clean it with. You can see this beautiful tiger oak. Um, the dark pot, top part is darker, the very top was completely black, and as I cleaned it, if you've ever smelled coal soot from a coal burning stove, that's what it smelled like. This thing would have been high on the wall because of its size, and it was somewhere that was heated with a coal stove, and you can see the darkness of it. Same way with this one on the table, that's why it's so dark, it had coal soot all over it. But that's a variety. Um, you know, they're, they're all self-winders, they work different ways. All of the mules are going to be an identical system. All the self-winding company will be a very uh, uh, similar or, or system and some variations in how the synchronizers work and what they do. Do they drive a bulb? Do they drive a bell? Uh, there's some changes there, but they're, they're basically the same movement. The uh, uh, little kickers over there, that was something new to me. I'd never seen those before. So those are really cute, and uh, you know, you'll hear those things fire every time they fire up. But I think the biggest offender is the Van Slyke, because when that thing fires up, and it's, uh, it's a little noisier than I would want in my home. But anyway, gives you a good representation of what's out there. There's other, other brands out there. This is just what was available to me from people's collections. And like I say, I just wanted to relate what I learned about these as I was working on it. And uh, it's, just, it's been very interesting. So that's about it. Thank you.